can't sleep? Don't want to sleep? Afraid to sleep? Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Did you check your closet? And under your bed? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in. Make yourself comfortable. Lay back. Close your eyes. And let me tell you a story. Belief, they say, requires faith. An unfailing certainty that what you think is true actually is. But just because your faith makes something true for you, does that make it so for everyone else? If, for example, someone believed you were, say, a werewolf, would that in itself be enough to transform you into a bloodthirsty beast when the moon was full? Or would that belief need to be built on a more solid foundation of fact and knowledge? In either case, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, or, in this case, the listening. Enjoy. Howl. Alan Cheney woke to a dull ache in his right shoulder and that side of his neck. He tried to open his eyes, but the light in the room was too bright. He squeezed them shut and turned his head away. The movement caused that dull ache to erupt into a storm of fiery pain reaching deep into his flesh. Don't move, a voice told him. A woman's voice, one he didn't recognize. Where am I? Alan asked. His voice sounded hoarse. His throat was sore. Here, drink this the voice offered. He opened one eye into a slit and saw that there was a straw in front of his face. Alan instinctively opened his mouth and then felt the straw touch his lower lip. He closed his mouth and sucked, drawing the cold water over his parched tongue. The first swallow was painful, but the more he drank, the easier it became. The straw was pulled away. Easy, you don't want to drink too much. Alan took in a deep breath and found that that simple act was painful as well. Was there any part of him that didn't hurt? Am I in a hospital? He asked. Yes, the woman responded. What happened to me? You don't remember? Alan tried to bring up his most recent memories. He had been heading home after a late night at the office. He had taken a shortcut through the park. It was a nice summer evening. He had passed a couple walking in the opposite direction. But aside from them, he seemed to be alone. He recalled looking up at the full moon. It was unusually big and bright and cast pale shadows across the neatly manicured grass from the trees and lampposts and benches that lined it. But beyond that, he couldn't remember anything else. Was I shot? he asked, thinking maybe he had encountered a mugger. He had been held up before at knife point, but in that instance, the thief was satisfied taking his watch, wallet, and phone and leaving Alan alive, though emotionally shaken. No, you were attacked by an animal, the woman told him. That was probably the last thing Alan had expected to hear. There were no wild animals in this part of the state, let alone the city. You'd see the occasional stray cat or rat rummaging around a dumpster. But what could have put him in a hospital? An animal? What kind of animal? The doctors think it might have been a large dog. The policeman who came to your aid described it as a wolf. A wolf? Ellen asked. His voice cracked and he started coughing. (coughs) The woman, Ellen could now see she was a nurse, clad in pink scrubs, wearing pink nitro gloves, a colorful cap that hid her hair, and a disposable surgical mask over her face, offered him the straw again. He leaned forward slightly to suck up a couple mouthfuls of water, then laid back again. How long have I been here? Just under a day. You had surgery to repair some of the damage to your shoulder, and you've been asleep since then. Surgery? Nothing too major. The wounds weren't as deep as they could have been. Apparently you were wearing a thick leather jacket, and that protected you from any serious damage. Alan remembered something else from the previous night. A sound, something disturbing. And even though it was a pleasant summer's evening, he had felt a chill, and had turned up the collar of his motorcycle jacket. My jacket, he said weakly. I'm afraid you won't want it back. It was completely soaked in blood. By the way, my name is Jillian. I know you've been sleeping all day, but you really should try to rest. Your body needs to recuperate. Ellen looked to the nurse. Her name was printed on a tag attached to her scrubs. He looked around. Apparently his injuries had earned him a private room. His was the only bed. He had been in the hospital a few times before. Once was when he had passed a kidney stone. 
That pain had been intense, like someone slowly pushing an ice pick into his back and twisting it. Another time he had been dehydrated and had passed out on an unusually hot fall day running through the very same park he had been attacked in the previous night. On both of those occasions he had had to share a hospital room. He could see an infusion pump mounted to an IV stand that had a large bag of saline and a couple other smaller bags attached to the loops of metal at its top. Alan looked over at the whiteboard where he expected to see his name, vital stats, meds, and information about his doctor. But it was blank. Then he noticed something else. At the foot of his bed, his ankles were bound in padded restraints. He tried to sit up, but something was holding him to the bed. He tried to raise his hand and pull down the blanket to see what it was, but he couldn't move his arms. They, too, were fastened to the rails of the bed with leather straps. Relax, Mr. Cheney, Jillian said in a soothing voice. Ellen was instantly anything but relaxed as he suddenly felt an intense panic and the rush of adrenaline that accompanied it. Why am I tied down? he asked. What's going on? This is for your own safety, the nurse told him. Safety? What are you talking about? Jillian sighed, then tried to smile reassuringly. There is a small chance that you may have gotten an infection, she said. An infection? What kind of infection would... Ellen instantly assembled all the information he had been given in the last few minutes into one terrifying conclusion. Do I have rabies? he asked. The nurse placed a comforting hand on his uninjured shoulder. No, no, it's not rabies. You were given the vaccine and a dose of HRIG, but purely as a precaution. Besides, you wouldn't be exhibiting symptoms this soon after a bite. Ellen breathed a sigh of relief. He knew there was no cure for rabies once you had symptoms, so it was reassuring to know that he had been treated. But if it wasn't rabies, he looked over at the nurse. Then why am I tied down? Oh, I did that, Jillian confessed. What? I need to keep an eye on you, so I managed to get you transferred to the psych ward. You know, the doctors never read the forms you ask them to sign at the end of a shift when they want to get out of here, and the transportation guys don't ask questions. They just follow the instructions the computer spits out. Why do you need to keep an eye on me? Ellen asked, suddenly fearful. Because the infection you might have has no cure, and if you do start exhibiting symptoms, I don't want you to hurt anyone. Ellen was confused. Is that why you're wearing a mask and gloves? No, not at all, Jillian told him. I'm wearing these so in case you are not infected, you won't be able to describe my face, and so I don't leave any fingerprints. By the way, my name's not really Jillian, she added in a whisper. And I do hope I'm wrong. I really do. Wrong about what? What do you think I have? Lycanthropy, she pronounced carefully. What? Jillian took a deep breath and squeezed his shoulder gently and compassionately. I believe you may have been attacked by a werewolf, she said. Ellen looked into Jillian's eyes. She didn't look crazy. A werewolf? he asked. She nodded. Ellen started to laugh, but his laughter quickly turned into a cough. Jillian offered him the ice water once more, and he sucked at the straw, then cleared his throat. He smiled at her. Did Jerry put you up to this? Is this some kind of a joke? He looked around the room and spied the private bathroom in one corner. You can come out now, Jerry. You got me. You got me good. No one emerged from the bathroom. Ellen looked up into the consoling eyes of the nurse. You're crazy. You're like one of those angels of death. No, I'm not like them. I don't go around killing otherwise healthy people. I would never do that. I took an oath, she assured him. That doesn't mean you're not crazy, Ellen replied. No, I guess it doesn't. You're just going to have to trust me, Jillian said. If it turns out you're not infected and you don't transform into a wolf tonight, then I'll make sure you return to the recovery unit so you can live a long, healthy life. Though you might have to give up any dreams you might have had of being a major league pitcher. Ellen tried not to laugh again. She didn't seem crazy, but there was a seriousness to her demeanor and the way she spoke that he didn't find reassuring. That's good news, he said. That means you'll be letting me go in the morning, because there is no such thing as werewolves. Jillian shook her head. That's what they want you to think, she said. The fact is, there has been a rash of killings over the last few months. People disappearing, body parts being found, corpses that have been eaten, all around the full moon. Ellen couldn't take her seriously. Listen, I know crime in the city has been on the rise, and I'm sure if you look at every day of the month, 
there are people who are killed or go missing. And if there really were people who were being eaten, we certainly would have seen it on the news. The nurse shook her head. I've seen the bodies. It's true, she said. Look, I work with numbers and statistics every day. I see facts bent and twisted to support all types of conclusions, many times completely contradictory ones from the very same data. Werewolves cannot be responsible for whatever pattern you think you're seeing because they don't exist. They're a fiction dreamed up by Hollywood. Jillian looked at Alan, her eyes focused and unblinking, staring at him over the paper mask. Werewolves are real, she said, with more sincerity than Alan had ever heard from anyone about anything ever before. It gave him chills. My sister was killed by one. She had her throat torn out, flesh ripped from her face, her chest, her abdomen. The creature had eaten her heart and her liver. I was the one who found the body. I could see in her eyes the terror she had experienced, the horror she had witnessed. Don't tell me werewolves don't exist, Mr. Cheney, because I know they do. Ellen swallowed painfully, the soreness he had felt earlier returning as his mouth dried out. He felt urine flowing as his bladder released its load, but he didn't sense any warm wetness on his leg. Instead, he heard it start to fill a bag attached to the catheter that had been inserted into his urinary tract. Jillian looked down at the bag. Good color, no blood, she said out of habit, as if he was any other patient not someone she had strapped down in a quiet corner of the psych ward. Help! he shouted. Someone, please help me! Oh, Alan, you seem like a smart man. You know that won't accomplish anything. Half of the patients here are paranoid, and these rooms are quite soundproof. Alan stopped his shouting and looked into the eyes of the strange nurse once again, trying to discern just how crazy she might be. You're really going to let me go if I'm not a, a werewolf? he asked. The word felt odd on his tongue. I promise, Jillian said, nodding reassuringly. Okay. Alan looked out the narrow window next to the bathroom. It was dark outside. He turned his gaze to the nurse. Well, it's already dark and I'm still human, he said triumphantly with a smile. He took in deep breaths of relief. I'm human. The moon hasn't risen yet, Jillian replied. She checked her watch. But we'll know in a few minutes. Well, Ellen said confidently, I'm sure if I haven't exhibited any symptoms by now, I must be okay. Perhaps, Jillian conceded. Do you feel itchy at all? Ellen tried not to think about feeling itchy, but of course just the mention of it sparked an itch on the tip of his nose. No, he lied. How about your joints? Any discomfort? You mean aside from the ache in my shoulder from getting bitten by a dog? Jillian inspected the morphine pump across from her on the other side of Ellen's bed. Could be the painkillers are suppressing it, she thought out loud. Her eyes widened. When was the last time you shaved? she asked. Yesterday morning, I guess, he answered. The nurse looked at the hospital room window. Ellen looked over as well. There was just the edge of the full moon visible, creeping slowly into view. Suddenly, Ellen felt his hands itch. He looked down. They were covered in a soft, downy layer of brown fur that was slowly thickening. Oh my God, he exclaimed. Oh my God! Alan looked at Jillian, who looked at him with now sorrowful eyes. No, no, this can't be real. Werewolves are not real. This isn't happening. Jillian reached into a bag that was sitting next to her on the floor. What are you going to do? Alan asked. You're a werewolf, Alan. If I don't stop you, you will change into a horrific beast and kill people. Stop me? Stop me how? With a silver bullet, of course, she answered pulling something out of her bag. You're going to shoot me? He asked. They'll hear it. You'll never get away. They'll catch you. Jillian showed Ellen a transparent pouch containing a cloudy liquid. Not that kind of silver bullet, she said, as she calmly walked around the bed to the IV stand. She hung the bag on one of the loops at the top, then connected a tube to an opening at the bottom. What is that? Ellen asked. Colloidal silver, Jillian explained. Some people use it because they believe it boosts the immune system, which is questionable, but it actually is very good at treating wounds and burns. Fun fact, if you take too much of it, you actually turn silver. In your case, though, I'm afraid it will kill you. Don't, he begged. You don't have to do this. Yes, I do, she said, and released the clamp that allowed the fluid to mix with a saline line and flow into his veins. The transformation was progressing faster now. 
The fur covering his skin was now a thick coat, mostly brown with white patches on his ears and around the muzzle that now protruded from his face. His bones started to change, reconfiguring themselves into the skeleton of a predator. His teeth thickened and became longer and sharper. His hands and feet transformed into paws, ending in talon-like claws. The werewolf howled. Then, its frantic struggle just stopped. It lay still. The heart rate monitor that had been reporting Alan Cheney's vital statistics let out a steady tone. Jillian switched it off. She looked at the body strapped to the bed and let out a tear. He hadn't fully transformed, and she could see what remained of his humanity in his eyes. Those frightened eyes set in the face of a horrifying beast. Surely when they discovered his body, they would take the anonymous tips she had made to the police more seriously. There was a werewolf on the loose. Likely more than one. Jillian scratched at her arm. There wasn't much time. She grabbed her bag and stuffed the pouch with the remainder of the colloidal silver into it. She scanned the room for anything else she might have left that could identify her and opened the door to peer into the hallway. It was empty. She started walking briskly past the elevators to the stairwell, bounding down the steps two at a time, nearly stumbling as she felt her bones begin to bend and twist. She had learned she could postpone the transfiguration, but not completely stop it. At the bottom of the stairs was a doorway that led outside into the summer night. She tossed the bag into a nearby dumpster and ran. With each step, her body changed. Dark gray fur covered her skin. The shoes she wore split as her feet grew larger and razor-sharp claws sliced through the fabric and laces. The shredded sneakers fell away, discarded among the detritus in the alley. The scrubs were also torn into shreds as her body changed and grew. Her face burned in agony as her mouth transformed into a snout. New, enticing scents filled her animal nose, and instinct took over. By the time she reached the end of the alley, she was fully a wolf. The woman no longer had control over her actions, but she remembered everything as if she was watching a horrifying movie play out in front of her. She could remember the previous night when she had attacked Alan in the park, her attempt to administer a killing blow thwarted by the thick leather of his jacket. She could remember the night she had killed her sister. The wolf turned to face the moon, lifted its head, and howled into the night. A girl screamed. The creature turned and saw a pair of humans across the street from her, the female clutching her mate in a panic. He tried to turn, to run away, but the girl's frantic actions caused them both to fall. The beast snarled and sprang toward the pair, eyes wide and mouth open. Thank you for listening to Howl, written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's Fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Rate us on Apple, Spotify, and Audible. And share these stories, as well as the unabridged audiobook versions of my novels, with anyone you know who enjoys audio fiction. Be sure to visit bedtimestories.studio, where you can sign up for our Insomniac's Snoozeletter, to be notified of new episodes and exclusive offers, and get a free bookmark. You can visit richhosick.com to learn more about the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs. Thanks again, and all the very best.